So what I want to do real quick is do a little bit of live coding. Not so much. I guess I would do some of live. It is some pre-made scripts, and not really scripts, but just programs. Very very minimal programs. Kind of show a few different topics a bit more in depth and show how you can actually alter them and the actual variables. Basically, I went over a lot of it during the actual previous videos and slides, but I kind of want to expand on it and show how we can manipulate it and change it to suit ourselves a bit better and then also just show how it works while it's actually just being done actually in front of you as opposed to just here's a slide here's a reading here's me talking about it just kind of show it a little bit so i'm gonna hop on over to my text editor real quick i have a few programs over here let's take a look um do i want to do int math or ascii first Let's do this. I think it's pretty simple. So, what we have here is basic include our main function, not a big deal. Two variables, var1, var2. You can also do this, you can just on the same line, not a big deal. And we have two print statements and then two scans. So, print and scan, print and scan. But basically, I am manually setting both of these integer values here. The goal is to show how integer division works and how we can get around that if we just have integer values and then also add modules to the mix and yeah I think that's good. So I'm going to manipulate this a good bit to change it. It'll change over the course of this so I do expect that. So first things first I know this already should work int math.c and out good so let me maximize this real quick so please enter an integer let's do uh, whatever that is a5 and then another one is going to be well we want it to be smaller so let's do 12 yeah sure 85 and 12 so if I enter that a quotient is going to be seven and my module is going to be one so actually that's really close to being divisible but you can tell that 12 will go into 85 seven times and we'll have one left over. So if I were to do the exact same thing again, and I choose six and do 12, my module is two, but my question is still seven. So we don't have any altered remainder because they were doing integers. So there is no decimal remainder whenever I get my quotient. However, modulus, which is the result of a module operation, is going to be one higher because we have now two left over. So, do a four instead with a 12. Then we still have seven with a modulus of zero, indicating that 84 is divisible by 12. And then if I were to do a very simple 83 instead, and then 12, I should get a quotient of six instead with a modulus of 11. So now we can't go in seven times, because if we did, we'd have a four because we know it's divisible. So it's one less now because we're gonna have 11 left over. So it's just one shy of being able to be divisible all seven times, but that's not how this works. And then if we wanted to determine, hey, what is, when to determine something's even, very easily we can do 87. actually open up the prompt so 87 and then if we want to determine something even we do two we don't care about the quotient here we care about the actual modulus and since it's not zero it means it's not divisible by two therefore this is not an even value modulus is one indicating that we have some remainder meaning that we have some value divided by two plus one which is going to be an odd number okay so I'm not gonna change it up. I think actually the modules part is fine. So moving on from integer math, let's go to ask here real quick. So this is dealing with, oops, I need to be a character. We have characters and we want to enter a character. We're gonna be scanning that in. Again, remember every time you see a scan, you're gonna see this ampersand here. Same thing with integer math as well. Both of these have this ampersand. It's looking for the actual variables, memory locations. So we're looking at the actual place in memory where this is. 
when we scan it to actually set it, we're not actually dealing with the character itself or the integer itself. We did that, actually. You'll notice we have a warning. It's uh, expecting a char star, which is a pointer, but we have a type of integer, which we do not want. But if we do ampersand here, you can see we're good. So then we have print f character percent c and then ask key value percent d so we're still taking char bar and passing that into both of these one's being passed as a character and one's being passed as the actual ask key value so let's take a look at that real quick see what we got oh no 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 out so inner character i'm gonna do um our character is a left parenthesis, the ASCII value is 40. And a little bit better of an example, let's do whatever that is. Nine. Cool. Character nine, ASCII value of 57. So I'm actually glad that I got a number here because my next fob is going to be zero. Actually, this. Character zero, the ASCII value is 48. So if we want to say get or i guess we want the actual integer we have a character that we're working with so you can tell here again i just said nine and zero yes my character is nine and my character is zero here but the actual number that i'm working with is 57 and 48 so if i want to do math with this i can't because i want to deal with nine not 57 or 48 and that's not okay so very very simple way of fixing this so I'm going to do this and is that what I want to do mm. you know what I'll tell you what I can change this decimal value let's do instead of char var over here we do char var minus a character of zero which we know is the value of 48 so we're doing the actual decimal value minus the decimal value of zero which is 48 so if we do this again i need to compile again uh let me do this a little bit let's see inner character if we do nine then I have a character of 9, which is the exact character value being passed in 2% C. But then I have decimal value of 9, which is the character value, which we know earlier was 57, minus the character value of 0, which we know is 48. So 57 minus 48 is going to be 9. So if I do this again, actual 0, then I'm getting 0, or the character 0, minus the character zero, which zeroes out. That's just exactly what I want. So we do a little bit more manipulation with, let's say, mm, lower, upper, let me see. Okay, let's try this. I think this will work. I think this is okay. Actually, before I do that, let's get it back to the way it was. Okay, let's try this. Now, I'll, I'll do A. Notice that lowercase a has a decimal value of 97. And uppercase a has a decimal value of 65. So unfortunately, the lowercase values have higher decimal encodings than their uppercase counterparts, which kind of confuses a lot of people. But if you look at it, we do 97 minus 65, we get 32. So the difference is going to be 32. Now, very easily, we could just say, okay, if I want to go from, I don't know, 
upper to lower, I would do nice there two lower upper. That looks good. I'm just gonna do my front C wrap real quick. Out this out and our A and I mean that worked but I forgot to encode it as a character instead. Not bad. Uppercase A and now I get uppercase A. The way we're getting 32 because remember I said that doing uh, literals like this like literal guys like this is a little bit confusing. The way that 32 works here same thing if we did lowercase a minus uppercase a so it's a difference here bringing the difference of these two values so very similar how we subtracted the character zero we are lucky with zero because it ends up zeroing out exactly what we want or here we need to subtract the difference in the range of our lower and uppercase characters A, I get uppercase A. If I do, I don't know. Wow, okay, B. <laughs> we get D, and I'm just gonna try Z real quick. I'm gonna get Z. So if I wanted to do it the other way around, oops. Then we do a lower. And instead of subtracting the difference, we add the difference. I do uppercase Z, I get lowercase Z, and we're good to go. So that's how we can do some ASCII manipulation with the actual data itself, because remember, characters at the end of the day, yes, they're encoded to be an actual letter, but they are numeric data types, ranging from 0 to 25, which brings me limits. So, do I, okay, yeah, I do need that. All right, so what were we doing here? is looking at the we're gonna be looking at signed and unsigned data we're gonna be looking at the lower and the upper limits of these data types and i'm gonna do this for a few of these different data types we have long to start with okay so we have signed long this gonna give us the high value is power of two 64 minus one minus one unsigned is power of 264 minus one and then similar for the lower values. And then we're printing out signed and unsigned. Okay. okay so uh, this did not work the way I wanted it to. I tested everything but long. Uh, when I did long, it's supposed to be 64 bit and it would overflow. You'll see what I mean just right now. It's supposed to overflow these lower limits to their appropriate values. Well, it's supposed to overflow the high value should be higher, low value should be zero here, but it's not working probably because it's 64 bit. But if we go over to int and do 32 and we get rid of the L for the longs you'll notice that our lower limits negative I think it's like 2 billion something and high is going to be about 2 billion something and then we also have a lower limit of 0 and a high of about 4 billion or so now, this is a difference between signed and unsigned. So part of signed is going to be, at least half signed, is going to be in negative values. But for unsigned, it starts at zero. We do not have negative values. We have zero and we have positive values. So the rest of that half is just shifted over into all the positive range. So you have half the range in signed, but you have it in both positive and negative directions. Whereas in unsigned, you have all the range of 32 bits, 
but it's only shifted in positive values, starting at zero, which is not positive, it's not negative, not positive, it's just neutral. So again, for unsigned, you have twice the range, but only in the positive direction. And in signed, you have half range, but in negative and in positive direction. So there are some trade-offs you need to be aware of. So if we move over to shorts, then we have 16 bits to work with. So now we want to add an H ceiling. And out and now instead of having two billion something, we now max out around thirty-two thousand, and then for unsigned we max out around sixty-five thousand. So we have two to the sixteen to work with instead of two to the thirty-two. So it's all based in powers of two, with in in this case being thirty-two bits, signs being sixteen bits, and we can go lower than that. Let's get old char which is eight bits and then i want to real quick and set back here and now all of a sudden we have negative 128 to 127 and then 0 to 255 you should recognize 0 to 255 pretty well because that is the ascii encoding that we have to work with though the only ones we really care about are about the first 128 so not a big deal now i digress what would be next? We did int math, we did passkey, we did limits. I think sig fig is gonna be next. Okay, so this is gonna be dealing with scientific notation and how we can adjust the output of floating point data. So let's take a look. We have basic SEI.h, we have a constant double. So Avo const is going to be Godger's number, which is 6.022140076 times 10 to the positive 23. So this is Avogadro's constant, and if we just print this out, we're printing out floating point data of Avo const. So let's see how that works. Oops. Oh. I see. There we go. And out, and now we have uh, six zero two two one four zero seven five live nines eight seven zero two three eight seven two dot six zeros. You might notice something real quick before we actually touch on the actual point of this. So we have I'm saying the twenty three, which is perfectly normal, but notice here we have. 4076 but this has 4075999999 blah 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 etc so precision on floating point data even if this is what i typed in it is going to have a hard time getting actual precise numbers and notice that in the next chapter that whenever we're dealing with floating point data and we need to compare against each other you do not compare directly because it is impossible practically impossible to get actual accurate perfect comparisons so we'll talk about that later so that that's when you see this rounding issue here and you also see this we have six values here and that's the default we always have six significant figures here to work with for the actual floating point data we can change that we can alter that maybe we just want three now obviously we don't really want any in this case it's just going to change to three but maybe we want oh 33 so what happens then we get a lot of zeros now this is mostly just silly in this case however what if instead we did m underscore pi include math.h now it's an i do c lang instead doesn't need to add minus m that math y Ooh, that's not what i want that's not what i want okay so now all of a sudden we have the math constant being brought in from the math library 
and it is pointing out that math has pi such a 3.141593 six significant figures here. So is that what math, is that what pi is? No. No, not at all. It never ends. What do I do? I don't know. Nine. Now we have one four one five nine two six five four. Now three three from earlier. Ooh, now it actually comes in handy. Now we actually have some repeating value. Let's do eighty. And you see, it's gonna it's gonna taper off somewhere, but we can get quite a lot of precision on the value of pi by doing so. So there's somewhere where this tapers off, but if you're working with data, like very, very minute data, then this might be important. So you can adjust it by doing point, the number of decimal points that you want here, so you have figures and all that that you want, and you're good to go. But for pi here, if we just do default for doubles and floats, then we are going to have this bog standard six. Now, back to our cost. This is times 10 to 23, which is insane. And I obviously don't want this. I don't want this number. That's the whole point why I have scientific notation. So we change F to an E. All of a sudden, I get 6.022141E plus 23, and again, we have positive 23. And if I want, I can change this as well in the same way by saying point three, I now have a very clean 6.022e plus 23, which is the common look of Avogadro's constant a lot of times. But let's say I make something completely else, like, I don't know. Let me just do this, I'm gonna make a constant. The double rand bar goes. 0. Big number, a very, very small number. A lot of floating point. What happens? I pile for no reason. My bad, I should have done this. But then I get 2.935 e to the negative 0, 0.2. And that's because I just chose this here, but if I get rid of this, just do E by itself. Now I have 2.934609E times 10 to the negative 2, which is about right what I expect because we have six digits to work with here. Not too bad. Now yeah, I add a few zeros here. Oh what that. Now I have 2.934609E to the negative five so we can adjust scientific notation as much as we want by doing stuff like this so if i want to do i don't know bring this out to 16. And you see we have some very long decimal but we know it's going to be e to the negative five giving us this part right here so we can move the decimal point for scientific notation just fine same thing if i were to put i don't know Get rid of this at this point somewhere right here what happens if i do this now we have 9.346091 e to the positive 11 giving us a scientific notation of this value right here and i can manipulate as much as i want if i want to clean up this output or i want a little more precision i can just have to do is do point let's just do three He's pretty clean, I like it. I get 9.346 times 10 to the positive 11. If we don't need you know, this full number, or if I need to know any of this really. So we can manipulate the precision and the format of floating point values quite a lot. And there's more than just this, but this is a pretty decent kind of scratching the surface aspect of it. So I think there's two more left. We ran an epoch, I think. Let's go ahead and do epoch real quick. 
put that with these. And then let's take a real quick look at what I have here. So we're including the time library. I have an integer of epoch equals int time zero. And so my printing out is percent D for the actual epoch. Seconds have elapsed since midnight UTC on January 1st, 1970. On the 1st of January, 1970. But I'm just disregard that. The ceiling minus LM epoch dot C is gonna give me what is this? Three three one billion six one billion six hundred and eighty-eight million eighty thousand five hundred and seventy-six seconds have elapsed since midnight UTC on first of January nineteen seventy. So that is the number of seconds that have elapsed since the point of epoch which is the number of seconds that we use to identify time so if i do it again i'm not recompiling i'm just doing this over and over again if i do it a bit too fast slow see it kind of counts as a timer it counts up every single second and it's going to be doing that natively because it's using epoch miles of heart called unix time basically it's how we have digital time is the number of seconds since this point in history. Now, that's great and all, and we can use it momentarily, but if we wanted to say, I don't know, figure out the number of minutes, then we can do this. Epoch min equals 60 Oop, I should do min minutes and then do this I can see a much smaller number of minutes has passed and if I want to continue that well going hours hours Hour. and did I do something wrong I did do something wrong my bad there we go paint that right there and now another smaller value has shown up and if I want to keep going then we can take a look at, I don't know, days. Before, how many days have passed since then? I will fix that last bit right here. I'll make that mistake again. I see, yeah, we have 19,537 days have passed. And if I want to continue going, get a little more see here Make a mistake here go weeks uh oh what do I got oh typo my bad we have 814 weeks have elapsed since then that's not true that seemed way too small. 2,791 seems a bit more accurate. And then I think, let's see if I have my math right. I believe there are 52 weeks in a year. Make sure I got this right. 53 years of elapsed since then, basically 1970. Yep, so this all is correct. If we do just a little bit of math, you can see how we can actually get some pretty accurate times based on this one point. Now, it might seem very arbitrary, and honestly, that point is a little arbitrary, but it was a decent point that we chose, and it's going to continue being that point for a good bit longer, but we'll eventually run into some issues later on, which I might talk about later, but for right now, 
I just want to go ahead and get to this last bit, which is rand.c, which is random. So basically we have int var1 equals rand, then print f sent d slash n var1. One second, momentarily to check something. Who got that? Okay. Real quick, I need to check a command. Get it. Okay. Yeah, okay, that's what I thought. Just wanted to make sure. So, what we're doing here is including the standard library. So, std lib, we have input output, and var1 equals rand, and then print f percent d slash n. So, what we're doing is generating some random number here. What do you see, Lang? Oops, don't come. Rand out scene. And then I do that out. And you see, yep, that's a random number. I didn't choose that. No idea what that's about. But we keep running it. You notice something. It's not changing. I'm not controlling that. It's just not changing. What if I recompile? It's still not changing. It's not really supposed to. It's based on a seed. So real quick, let me see what happens when we do this. This one of our two of our three. And all of a sudden we do have three unique RAM numbers, but notice again, never changing. Recompile doesn't change not going to that's okay so what happens we do something like this make sure it's right uh, let's do 78 okay that's different so changing my seed to 78 instead of zero which is what the default is it's going to be fine, but also we're back at the same problem. We're not changing. But if I change this to say 54, compile that, then we're good. It does change. How can we fix this? Well, this changes every single second. So what happens? I take a value that always changes and use that as my seed. Change every single second. Let's compile it. Compile it once. That's all I'm going to do. Let me just maximize this real quick. There's some values. There's some new values. There's some new values. And so now, this is about as close that as we can get to getting decently true random data. Now again, it's not exactly truly random because we have one issue that if I run it in the same second, then all of a sudden you can tell it's actually the same second because every time I have a command entered, you can tell that this was done at 624, Four seconds in 444 seconds, and that's the same second. So, Epoch hadn't updated, so it was the same value. So, we're getting the same data, but it was here that this was a 22 second data. Here it's changed 25, also changed 44 is also changed. So, if I do it here, then at 23, it's here, and at 24, it was here. So, we can have some 
fairly truly random values. And if I wanted to, let's say, let me do that D slash and D. Um, um, get dice. Now we get a four, five. Mm, five. I think that looks good. Now what I want to do is see. I would like one of these all by six. And I would also just for formatting sake like to do one. I think we should have exactly what I'm looking for. Let me, real quick, file that, run it. 65151, 5166, and we have a full house. So, uh, real quick, what I did here was basically create a very, very rudimentary version of Yahtzee. So if you run it every single second, you'll have new random data. And since I modulated by six, you can only have a range of data between zero and five, but out of one, just for, again, like I said, formatting. So now we have the values of one through six as our actual outputs. And I have five of them. So now I have five, five, six, five, six, which would I think be a full house and Yahtzee. So there we go. Yeah, I'll run it just a few more times. Oh, wow. That was actually really close. That's cool. Okay, anyway. So that was just a fun little play with game and you can add a little bit of logic here to determine it and get the actual pairs and the types and stuff. So you get a pretty simple yacht to game doing something like this. So again, it's not truly random, but again, we don't really have anything that is truly random. But this is about as, this is a good solution this is honestly a really good solution there are ways you can improve upon this we're not gonna really touch on it right now but i think this is good enough so all that being said that's about all i got for this i guess kind of live session here i do hope it was helpful i hope it helped kind of expand a little while top on the previous videos and i hope you learned something so without further ado i guess we'll see you in the next video